Now let me see your war face! Ah! Four inches from your chest, Kyle! Four inches! Oh, if God wanted you up there, he would have miracled your ass up there by now, wouldn't he? Say yes, sir! Get your fat ass up there, Pyle! Say yes, What sir. the hell is the matter with you, anyway? Blood! 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 What do we do for a living, ladies? Kill! 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 The individual showed what one motivated Marine and his rifle can do. And before you ladies leave my island, you will... Outstanding, Private Pyle. I think we finally found something that you do well. Sir, the Private's weapon's name is Charlene, sir. Private Pyle, you are definitely born again hard. In 1980, Stanley Kubrick began conducting research for his next project based on Gustav Hashford's novel, The Short Timers. Kubrick always looked for short form material that he could adapt, and he'd read about Gustav Hashford's The Short Timers in 79. Hashford would co write the screenplay along with Michael Hare, author of the Vietnam War memoir Dispatches. Michael Hare was a great expert. He, he wrote this book, Dispatches. So, he was a top authority on that period. Originally titled Short Timers, after Hashford's book, Kubrick changed the title out of fear it would be misread by audiences as referring to people who only did half a day's work. The title was changed to Full Metal Jacket after Kubrick came across the phrase in a gun catalogue. Kubrick began conducting research for the film, watching archive footage and documentaries, reading Vietnamese newspapers on microfilm from the Library of Congress, and studying hundreds of photographs from that era. Initially, Hare was not interested in revisiting his Vietnam War experiences, and Kubrick spent three years persuading him to participate in what the author described as a single phone call lasting three years with interruptions. At some point, Kubrick wanted to meet Gustav Hashford in person, but Hare advised against this, describing the short-time authors as a scary man, and believed he and Kubrick would not get on. Nonetheless, Kubrick insisted and they all met at Kubrick's house in England for dinner. It did not go well and Hashford did not meet with Kubrick again. The film is cut into two sections. The first follows a group of enlisted marines and specifically two characters. The first section follows Private Pyle and Private Joker as they grow accustomed to an unrelenting training regime made into a nightmare by an abusive drill instructor. Sir, no sir! The second follows Private Joker's journey as a journalist, documenting, photographing and interviewing soldiers in Vietnam. Through Warner Brothers, Kubrick advertised a national casting search in the United States and Canada. The director used videotape to audition actors and received over 3,000 submissions. He was willing to look at anybody's audition tapes, so you had every actor in the world making these audition tapes and sending them off. His staff screened all of the tapes, leaving 800 of them for Kubrick to review personally. Kubrick hired a former US Marine drill instructor, Ali Ermey, to be technical advisor on the film. We called an office in the United States that represents ex-Marines, and we asked for a drill instructor. Ermey asked Kubrick if he could audition for the role of Hartman, but Kubrick turned him down, having seen his performance as a drill instructor in the film Boys in Company C. Yeah, quickly! We'll have all day, ladies. Anytime, anytime. Move it up. Next five, next five. Kubrick felt he wasn't volatile enough for the role, instead giving him the role of Gunnery Sergeant Hartman to Tim Corseri. I have your senior drill instructor. From now on, you'll speak only when spoken to. But after Ermi sent Kubrick videotapes of him improvising insulting dialogue to a group of extras, demonstrating a drill instructor's ability to break down new recruits, Kubrick gave Ermi the role, stating he was a genius for this part. While Ermi practiced his lines in a rehearsal room, Kubrick's assistant Leon Vitali would throw tennis balls and oranges at him, which Ermi had to catch and throw back as quickly as possible, while saying his lines as fast as he could. Any hesitation, slip or missed line would necessitate starting over. Twenty error-free runs were required. He was my drill instructor, Ermi said of Vitali. At one point during filming, Ermi had a car accident in which he broke all of his ribs on one side and was out for four and a half months. 
Tim Corsari was offered a small role as a door gunner. This scene was shot in a moving helicopter. <laughs> Vincent D'Onofrio gained £80 to play Private Pyle. Although an athlete, after gaining £80, boot camp training was almost impossible. He was also having to overeat to ensure he didn't lose any weight and sustained injuries during filming. He had no filming experience during the time and was working as a bouncer at the Hard Rock Cafe. I saw a lot of films, but I saw film actors as being very different people than myself. After eight months of negotiations, Matthew Modine was cast as Private Joker. During filming, he was confused as to how the character should be played, with Kubrick telling him to act naturally. Cowboy's death scene shows a building in the background that resembles the famous alien monolith in Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Kubrick described the resemblance as an extraordinary accident. Denzel Washington was also interested in starring in Full Metal Jacket, but Kubrick never sent him a script to audition. To ensure the actor's reaction to Ermi's lines were as authentic as possible, Ermi and the recruits did not rehearse together. For film continuity, each recruit had to have his head shaved once a week. The cast went through all the boot camp training regime of an enlisted marine. I think they got extremely fit on that film, the actors. As always, Kubrick's fear of flying prevented him from travelling, so the film was shot in England, specifically East London as he didn't like to travel more than 10 miles from his home. The last time he'd left England was to attend the premiere of 2001 in which he travelled by boat. A former Royal Air Force Station and then British Army base, Basington Barracks, doubled as the Paris Island Boot Camp. Kubrick acquired four M41 tanks from a Belgian Army Colonel who was an admirer of the director's work. He also obtained a selection of rifles, M79 grenade launchers and M60 machine guns from a licensed weapons dealer. He also painted helicopters green to resemble those used in the war. Beckton Gasworks, which was scheduled to be demolished, was used to film the later Vietnam scenes. At one time it was one of the largest plants in Europe, built to manufacture coal, gas and other products, running from 1870 to 1976. Kubrick blew up buildings and a wrecking ball was used to knock holes in others. Asbestos and hundreds of other chemicals poisoned the ground and air, making it a nightmare environment to work in. In order to make Beckton look more like Vietnam, Kubrick flew in palm trees. Today, virtually no trace of the old gasworks now exists. For the period music, Kubrick went through Billboard's list of top 100 hits for each year from 1962 to 1968. He tried to use many songs but found they were so overpowering it was hard to fit dialogue in over them. As ever with Kubrick, the film was made at a very slow pace, with the actors' contracts extending months and scenes lasting weeks at a time. Unlike the novel, the film greatly expands the relatively brief section in part one about the boot camp on Paris Island and essentially discards part three. This gives the film a twofold structure, telling two largely independent stories connected by the same characters acting in each. At that time, Kubrick talked about wanting to explode the usual conventions of narrative structure. Sergeant Hartman's role was expanded for the film in the novel, Hartman confides to the Marines he believes Private Pyle is mentally unstable, but this was cut for the film adaptation. It was felt showing a warmer side to Hartman would upset the balance of the movie. Instead, it's Private Joker who raises doubts in the scene where he mops the latrines. Leonard talks to his rifle. Overall, the film has a more tragic tone, whereas the novel is filled with a lot more humour. The film received mixed reviews on its release, mainly positive for the first section of the movie, but critical of the latter part film set in Vietnam. Rita Kempley of the Washington Post wrote, It's as if they borrowed bits of every war film to make this eclectic final. The views of Siskel and Ebert summed up the dividing opinion of the film during its release. Few films have been more eagerly awaited this summer than Full Metal Jacket, and few films, I'm afraid, will be more disappointing. It invites comparison with Platoon, and I'm afraid it suffers by that comparison. This isn't a bad film, but it's not a great film. It's not original, and it's not a masterpiece. Oh, I think it's very original and very close to being a masterpiece. The training sequences are absolutely startling. Platoon was about embracing the soldier. This fighting, to me, is about the mixture of, of joy in fighting and the absolute fear of being killed. One thing every critic agreed upon was Arlie Ermey gave an outstanding performance. 
He won Best Supporting Actor at the Boston Society of Film Critic Awards. A single full metal jacket, I Wanna Be Your Drill Instructor, was released to promote the film. Amazingly, it reached number two in the UK singles charts. Overall, the biggest problem was Kubrick had started work on the film in 1980. By the time it was released seven years later, several films about the Vietnam War had already come to the big screen. His wife commented after his death, he didn't ever like that he made so few films, he always wished he could have done more, and if he had any negative feeling in his life, it was that he was slow. <laughs> 